Well, welcome everybody to Outside the Binds. We're glad you're joining us. I know we've had a little bit of a sporadic uh, schedule here for our, our episodes during the early fall, but we're going to get back on track, we promise you. And tonight we have an incredibly special, well, as you're watching, whenever you're watching, uh, we have a wonderfully special guest to help us become more educated. Educated is the word here uh, about wine. You're looking at George Stakos. And we're all meeting George uh, for the first time, except for our showrunner that you'll meet in just a second. But George Stakos is uh, an educator and longtime industry sales and marketing director. He launched a few years back the Educated Grape, which provides sales, marketing, and branding consulting for small luxury wineries, educational wine programs geared towards wine enthusiasts. Okay, there you go. There's our, there's our hook. Uh, George has been in the wine business forever. Senior sales and marketing positions with Jordan Vineyard and Winery, uh, one that's close to my heart, with one of the great winemakers of our time in Rob Davis, Huneus Vintners, Quintessa, I think you've heard of Quintessa, Faust and Illumination, also Ramey Wine Cellars. He has sales and marketing acumen through distribution channels forever. The education, the excuse me, the educated grape portfolio of wineries includes Laurel Grin Vineyard in Sonoma, Rasa Vineyards in Walla Walla, and some Sara Wine Company in Santa Barbara. They make wines of the highest quality that reflect the unique growing regions which they are from. Uh, this is phenomenal. So we're really gonna get educated tonight. We're actually gonna taste a Barbaresco. Our Parker is with us remotely. Glenn is gonna join us in a minute to share his tasting expertise of this wonderful Barbaresco that we have. But George, I apologize for that lengthy, uh, <laughs> lengthy oh, intro, yeah. but you deserve it. Thank you for being with us. It's oh, wonderful to meet you. Thank you, Ted. It's my pleasure. That was a very sweet introduction. I appreciate that. And and we have to say that the, the brains of our operation, of course, is Adam Gordon. Um, Adam is our executive producer. But because Adam has a little bit of a Hollywood tint to him, I always refer to him in the Hollywood phrase. He's our showrunner. <laughs> and in Hollywood, showrunners mean we all bow before Adam, which we do. And Adam is going to jump in here and join us because... Adam, you met George. You introduced me to, and now all of our Outside the Vines viewers to George. So tell us about how you two connected. Well, I was a right winger for the Edmonton Oilers. He was a center and Gretzky wouldn't pass to us. Oh, no. Oh, you wanted the truth. Yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. Well, it's a sports broadcast. Uh, you know, uh, anyway, uh, the truth is, and actually you mentioned one of the wineries, Rasa. Uh, I joined that winery about a year ago. And as one of the membership benefits, we get these, um, I don't know what you'd call them, virtual, they're like virtual classes. Yeah, virtual tastings, tastings classes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. and George George would MC it with the chief winemaker, um, uh, Bill O'Navarain. I think I'm pronouncing that last name right. Um, yep. Anyway, so I met him just, I never really met him. I just watched him do these two shows and I thought to myself, him with Ted and Parker and Ashley, yeah, that that makes total sense. Yeah. So that's kind of how this all came about. That's phenomenal. So, so Adam, how educated have you become through your connections with George? Well, I just actually this has been the first we've really gotten to talk because during these classes we haven't gotten to speak. I'm, I'm pretty quiet. I I don't uh, ask a lot of questions. I just listen. But um, what he has had to say and what Billo has had to say about the wines has been excellent. But the thing that I'm excited about, and I hope you get into it tonight with the podcast, is what the educated grape can do for someone, say, of my caliber, where I know what I like, but I want to know why I like it. I want to get deeper in it. And I know that that's where George can be a big help to not just myself, but I'm sure all our viewers. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, George, what was your aha moment with wine? Aha moment. Well, it's interesting. It, it, it's actually interesting, Ted, that I ha that I had an aha moment because I'm uh, take you back just a, a, a couple of decades before. I'm of Greek descent, uh, born and raised in Miami, Florida, and and my parents oftentimes would have wine at the table. Is either at that time it was either a beer or that was the uh, the um, the start of white Zinfandel, believe it or not, in the 70s. Or it was Greek wine. It was a Greek wine called Retsina. And Ret Retsina uh, standing for resin. And Retsina, if you've ever had it or smelled it before, literally smells and, and tastes like pine resin. So I overcame that experience of drinking Retsina as, as a kid and actually uh, got into the wine, wine industry and love wine. But, uh, but that was, those are my early roots uh, of, of wine tasting. 
but you know, probably my aha moment was was before I got into the wine industry, I was in the hospitality industry. I worked for Four Seasons Hotels, and it, I was tasked for what writing the wine lists and 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 learning about wine. And it was through these everyday tastings of actually wines that people would leave behind. These beautiful wines, uh, you know, first or second growth Bordeaux, or a beautiful, you know, the cab from the Napa Valley or uh, for Barbaresco. And we would taste every night. And I just got to learn these amazing wines and taste the difference. And, and I was just enamored and blown away. So, but the one wine that really got me was actually a Napa Valley wine. It was uh, Peter Michael Le Pavos, 1994. Great vintage, great producer, Knights Valley. And I was just blown away. So someone who's, who's with us and watching us, and I've been a little bit of this in my adult life, uh, as soon as I moved to California a second time and became a little more knowledgeable about wine is how your palate gets educated. So how did yours get educated? Well, in tying it in to sports, a lot of it is, it's sort of muscle memory, but it's palate muscle memory. Huh. And back to that, what I was mentioning before about tasting and those experiences, tasting these amazing wines um, in the restaurant every night uh, while I was at the Four Seasons. But it's, that's how you really learn and appreciate wine is tasting. You can read about it, um, and that's really important. The reading and studying ties the tasting experience and ties them together. But tasting and understanding that um, a Cabernet from the Napa Valley and a Cabernet from um, you know Colchagua Valley in Chile, two same day, same grape variety, but the terroir and the climate and the, and the conditions are different, therefore making for different wines. So just sort of tasting over and over and really understanding the different expressions from different places. Did you ever think about sommelier? Yeah, I, I am. I'm a certified sommelier. I mean, you are. Oh, sure. I mean, absolutely. I, you know, I sat, I, I, I was on the, I was, I was, I was aspiring to be a master sommelier, which is sort of the pinnacle. Uh, you know, Billo, you mentioned Billo. Billo is a master of wine. It's also an amazing uh, and also another pinnacle of the industry. And uh, I got to the the advanced level and sitting for that level. And boy, you know, it's um, it's I passed the the blind tasting actually, but you know, didn't you know didn't didn't quite get to the uh, to the other areas because I was you know I was traveling a whole lot. I'd stopped being a sommelier. I was more on the road representing wineries, but yeah, no, definitely a sommelier. And uh, it's quite a journey to, to gain that, you know, that accreditation. Oh my goodness. That's wonderful to know. Have, I, I'm guessing, and please tell me if I'm wrong, you've seen the Netflix movie. Oh yeah. And yeah blind the the name. Help me. What's that? The name of the film. Psalm. Yeah. That was the young, the young, a yes. black man that was trying to studying to become and went through all of the incredible Ian Cobble, agony yes. to become a psalm. That is so, I mean, it's, it's, it was a great depiction and, and that's real yeah. life. And that's the, the level of detail and um, the, the vast, you know, information that you need to acquire and in, in, in tying it back into consumers, one of the reasons why I do what I do and why I'm so passionate about what I do is that, there's so much to learn. I think somebody who loves wine and is digging deeper into it is very overwhelmed. It's an overwhelming um, industry. It's overwhelming passion uh, and field. And what I love to do is try to help people sift through what it is that's really important for them to gain a greater appreciation. So um, yeah, no, it's um, quite a, quite a field, quite a journey. The, the film was phenomenal because, it, and we've touched on this in our Outside the Vines before, you know, to, to get diversity into the wine world is a wonderful thing. We had some women on a previous episode who've been winemakers, and that's why that film was under, uh, wonderful because here was a young black male whose family was running a barbecue restaurant, the you know person you would not expect to pursue that field. And it was wonderful to see his dedication and for those of us who now enjoy wine to see what it took the commitment it took to achieve what you have achieved. Congratulations, George. I tip my proverbial cap to you. It's, you know, when your vote, when your, uh, when your passion is your vocation and it's what you love to do, it's, it's a gift and it's uh, you know, it fuels the passion even more. 
But in, in now too, so those films, film, those films are great, and those depictions are great because there's so many more wines to experience, so many more regions that back when I first started in the industry 20 years ago, they existed, but they were not even on the radar at all. So we're, you know, we're exploring more and more different wines and great varieties and regions and, and people that, you know, we just never, you know, experienced before. So the playing field is, is, it's immense and, and that's great. So when, when we talked about the educated grape and what you've started, we referenced the phrase a couple of times, luxury wines. What is a, to you, what is a luxury wine? A luxury wine to me is a handcrafted wine. Um, and I mean, certainly premium wines by definition in the industry is anything, you know, over, let's say 12 or $14, which is a broad, a broad, uh, that's a whole large slew of wine, but luxury wine to me is handcrafted. It's, it's, uh, it's depicts place. It's a, it, it absolutely c connects to its sense of place, um, and, um, has a story and, you know, really stands for the varietal, the region, the people that represent it and, and, um, and craft it at, at a high level. I mean, at a, at a very high level. So, so here's where I'm going to ask you to help me. So when I hear the phrase luxury wine, I immediately say price point. Mm -hmm. Am I wrong on that? Well, to, in sort of achieving those things that I mentioned, uh, depending upon the economies of scale or the grape variety of the region that is being okay. grown in. Sure. Absolutely. And I mean, a luxury wine, you know, could be, you know, $500, it could be $50, but if it's, it's absolutely, you know, again, representing the, the very best of what can be, you know, contributed to that wine, whether that's, that's resources, uh, quality of the fruit, quality of the growing region, the, you know, the commitment from the producer, all of that is in play. So, yeah, but that's, it's not really one price point. So here in, in where I live in Northern California, mm -hmm. uh, I would throw two words out and see what you say. Screaming Eagle. What do you say? Luxury wine? Yeah, absolutely. It's a luxury wine. Um, and that, that, you know, that's, that wine came along, you know, that's when this term that you broadly hear now, cult wine, you know, that's, when I got into sales and marketing in the late nineties, that was, you know, wines like that, Harlan and, and, and Screaming Eagle, uh, those were sort of, you know, right, right in that vein, that sort of helped start that movement. But yeah, yeah. amazing, amazing wines. And, and, um, you know, it's a Napa Valley wine. I mean, Napa Valley has uh, created an amazing, uh, niche for itself. It's the preeminent region for, for Napa, for, for cab in the new world. But, um, you know, the, the price of fruit has gone up quite a bit and the, de you know, demand has fueled that, but it's, there's a, there's a point where that, that price point can, uh, you know, the eclipse and get to a point where people look to other regions, you know? Yeah. Screaming Eagle price point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. I, I've told, I've told Adam this story before. This is absolutely true. This was, uh, this past Christmas, and I live, uh, I live in, I guess you would say it's in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have a Costco near us that has an excellent wine department. Sure. It's obviously very smart wine buyers, excellent wines, very fair prices. But they also have a little special plastic cube. <laughs> and they had Screaming Eagle last Christmas. There was a Screaming Eagle for sale in Costco, 2500 one bottle. <laughs> one and bottle. I understand, look, I'm not arguing market. Market prices are set and that's fine. But it was just so jarring to me to walk into Costco <laughs> and see a Screaming Eagle. Well, I mean, they have immense buying power and they have an amazing selection, but it's also a sign of the times too, in that, you know, you probably wouldn't have seen that 10 years ago because it never would have needed to be there. But whether you're Screaming Eagle or, um, you know, Chateau Margaux or, or pick your luxury trophy wine. Um, there's, there's so much wine in the marketplace now. And, you know, there's so much, that price point is such where it's not, oftentimes it's not being sold through the channels that it was sold before. So there's new avenues that need to be explored and good, good for Costco for having the ability to, to get that wine.
And, I, and we are going to pivot. We're going to talk about Nebbiolo and the wine that we're going to taste at Barbaresco. But I, I, because you're so smart about this, George, and you you lived out here and worked out here, uh, the I hear, and tell me what you know about the concern I've heard, because we are living in, in just the world we're living in today, in our world here in Northern California, fires are real and they're likely not going away. And I'm hearing about the impact of the smoke on the grapes. So just give us, again, educate us. Tell me what you understand about that. Well, I mean, it's it's horrific and it's it's, it's unfortunate on, on, on many levels, more, you know, more important than wine in terms of people's lives and 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 livelihoods and, and how it affects their, their families and, and their, you know, their, their well being. But yeah, I mean, it's a huge concern. I mean, it's just been a, you know, unfortunate that it's happened so, so frequently in a, in a three year period. But, you know, one thing I want, I want to comment on, I mean, we can't obviously why it happens. There's, there's a myriad of reasons, but one thing I want to comment on for those that are, I mean, if you're, viewing in tonight you're you're passionate on on a certain level about wine and unfortunately sometimes uh fires in a certain year uh people will paint a broad brush of that vintage oh well 2017 oh that was the fire year so we s stay away from those wines or you know 2020 it was a fire you know there were fires so i i shouldn't be getting those wines and i want to comment because back to your our brief talk about luxury wines, that's where it ties into in another description, another attribute. So when you're a luxury producer, when you're, you're, everything you do is based on quality and integrity and sorting every grape specifically and, and touching every cluster, people at that level are not going to bottle something that is tainted or would ever taint their brand. So as consumers, like three of us are, four of us are, you know, you have to trust the producers that are, are putting in the work and know that if it's not, it's not of that level, they're not going to bottle it, whether there was some taint or, or otherwise. And I think that's important is that that's what you can also feel good about, you know, buying luxury level wines and, and family owned producers and, and high quality producers. That, that's that's actually great to hear. I'm so happy you said that because that's exactly what we would all, as the consumers, enjoyers of those wines, we want to know that, hey, when we pull the cork out of Harlan, we know we've we've invested, but that we're going to get a return on the investment. Yeah. And, and also, too, red wines, I mean, it depends on the timing, but in 20, white, you know, the whites were in. Anyone who really made any white wine, that was harvested. That, that was in that was in the barn, as they say, and in the winery, in barrel. And um, so white wines were largely unaffected. Um, and then reds, depending upon when you harvest, you know, could be unaffected as well. It definitely affected red wines, without a doubt. So the, you'll see very little 2020. But I think anybody who did bottle a 2020 at that luxury level or that high integrity, um, you know, handcrafted levels, putting something in the bottle that they'll be proud of. All right. So we, um, t t let's switch to Nebbiolo because we're going to, that's the wine we're going to, and our Parker is going to sample that, uh, as we all are. Uh, and as Adam has been done a great job of promoting our outside the vines, he knows I am a Brunello freak. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> and have had the incredible, privilege of going to Italy and I don't know, maybe half a dozen times. And uh, that's where I was introduced. And I just think Brunello is, is God's gift to wine for us humans. <laughs> so, so tell us about the Nebbiolo grape and how we find it and taste it and the varied wines in which we taste it here in the United States. Well, yeah, you know, when we talked about, you know, what grape to focus on in wine and, and we, we, and of course, you mentioned your love of Brunello. I'm right there with you. Love Brunello. I think it's one of the great values, um, at that, at that price point at 50 to $80 or 50 to $90 to get Brunello, uh, high quality Brunello is, is, is fairly easy to do. And it over delivers for the price value big time. But I think Brunello for a lot of us who love wine, we're getting more accustomed to it and familiar with it. And, um, so I thought, Nebbiolo would be a fun one to talk about because Nebbiolo um, is, I think, sometimes misunderstood. It's sometimes in the shadow of Sangiovese, whether it's Brunello or the Super Tuscan wines and so forth. So um, I love Nebbiolo because it's um, it's a savory grape. It's, you know, it's up in the, the Piedmont region, which is cooler climate, um, you know, sort of 
the Alps and, and, and right over the, you know, looking straight out to the Alps and sort of in the foothills. So it's a cool, it's a cool growing region, for, especially for red grape varieties. And it produces a savory style of wine with tension between sort of the spice and the acid and the fruit. And when produced at a, at a high level, like, you know, this particular producer, one of my favorites, uh, Pytene, it's, it's, it's magical and it's different. And um it's 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 just unique and i love the savory aspect to it and it's uh, from a food pairing perspective so so interesting as well but um and it sits and also specifically to barbaresco we wanted to feature this because that often sits in the shadow of its its neighbor barolo which is sort of the, the king of wine barolo is sort of the queen of wine it's a little a little more elegant and uh, it doesn't quite have maybe the tannic structure that Barolo has. So in its youth, it's a little more approachable. So there's so many great attributes of Nebbiolo, especially from Barbaresco that aren't often brought to light. So, And, and I love hearing that because that's a great point. And, and having, well, for those who may not be familiar with Italy, as you were saying, George, so whereas the Sangiovese and the Brunella to Tuscan, central Italy, this is Piemonte, as they say. This is the mountains. This is the Alps. It's really Austria. Yeah, I mean, you're <laughs> right. Yeah, the Swiss Alps are straight to the north. I remember yeah. when I was there, actually right pre-COVID, it was December of 19, and my wife and I went to Milan and then drove to uh, to Barbaresco and through um, Alba, and you know, it, it's all right there. But when you're there and you look, the Alps, you can feel like almost reach out and touch the Alps, which shield you know, shield the elements, the weather um, coming from the uh, from the north. And that's if those Alps aren't there, we're not talking about Barbaresco tonight or nobody is. And um, it's just uh, the, the the savory aspect to these wines. Um, and especially in, in a great vintage, you get that uh, this, the tertiary, the, the the dried fruit and the rose petal and a little of the the spice and to go along with this nice red, you know, sort of cherry, dried cherry. It's just beautiful. What, what what do you would be if and, and that's a wonderful description you just gave us of Barbaresco. What would be the difference um, for the novice drinker, someone who's who's saying, "Hey, I wanted to sample some Italian wines." What would be the, to you the diff simple differences between a Barbaresco and a Brunello? Boy, big difference. So, yeah. Brunello, warmer climate. It's Tuscany, right? It's Brunello. It's uh, uh, Montalcino. Nebbiolo, cooler climate, Piemonte. So because of that, you're going to have a weight and, and density difference. The Brunello is going to be a little more denser, darker yes. fruit. Uh, uh, Nebbiolo, a little uh, more, you know, more uh, lighter red fruit. Like we said, cherry and a little more, a little more acidity and savory. Um, and then Brunello is going to have a um, just a, a, a little more richness, a little more tannin, especially in its youth. Where Nebbiolo, because it's a thinner skin variety and a little lighter, it's going to have a little bit less. Um, you know, I think it's just totally a stylistic uh, difference. So if you like Pinot, and, and one thing I do in my wine classes, I, I always have a segment called, if you like this, you'll like that. And with Nebbiolo, it's absolutely, it's, um, you know, you know, Pinot Noir is definitely a great variety that immediately comes to mind in terms of similar, um, you know, um, Gamay, you know, to, you know, Cru Beaujolais in some respects, but, you know, it's more of that, you know, more elegant style of red wine versus Brunello. Like a little bit if richer. you like this, you like that. Okay. So if I like this, I'm holding up, this is what we're going to taste in a minute. So what would I pair this with? What would you say? Oh man, it's, there's so many things. So I mean, with this, you could go, I mean, you could even go a piece of, grilled swordfish with some some capers and maybe a little fennel or or dill or you know almost like a real nice mediterranean uh presentation uh or even like a nice um some stewed stewed tomatoes with some capers and, and onions uh you could you know you could do certainly um you know short rib um you know, roast pork, like a, a pork tenderloin, a grilled pork tenderloin with some, you know, roast peppers and rosemary. Just, it doesn't have to be beef. You know, with this, you could do a rich grilled fish or you can do a, you know, you know, some pork or you can do beef. It's very versatile. So Adam's going to jump back in here. Our showrunner, Adam, masters scallops, loves scallops. What do you think? 
the oh. smart rescue with some scallops. Are you kidding? The acid would cut through perfectly. I, I, yeah, no brainer, no brainer. And then one of the things, and we'll get to the interview with Parker in a second. I, I brought up the no brainer bolognese, like a slow cooked mm. bolognese. Yeah, I mean that's it's cliche, right? Italian food with Italian wine, but that just to me that just seems so good. In mushrooms, no, that, but you no, know, Adam, it's not cliche because one of the great aspects, especially in Italy, we've been there before, is the regionality of it where the foods from each region are meant to pair with the wines that are produced there. It's not rocket science when it comes to that. Uh, well, one of the best Brunellos I had in your, or, uh, in Italy was a, a Gaia Brunello. And yeah, I wouldn't call it an aha moment, but it was an ah moment. It was, <laughs> <laughs> it was good. Well, we have this wonderful wine that we're going to try here. And, and we have to tell you, it's the Sori Pitin Barbaresco. And again, I'll try to make sure we get it, the label in there a little bit so you can see it. And we really want to thank Central Wine Merchants. They're in Flemington, New Jersey, and they have provided this wine for us tonight. They're a family-owned wine shop, hundreds of wines from all over the world. They ship anywhere in the United States, of course, state laws pending. So for that next special bottle, which you can't seem to find on any of the big wine websites, just give it a try. Central Wine Merchants, that's, as you would expect, Central Wine Merchants.com. And we really do thank them for helping us out as we, as we really try to get some traction for our web, uh, for our little video podcast here. And so now, uh, George, we're going to have to bring in our Parker, <laughs> the great Glenn Parker with his sophisticated palate. He's going to join us remotely tonight. And Glenn had a chance to taste this sorry Pitine Barbaresco. So Glenn, be our Parker. Glenn, I'm not a, I'm not very familiar with Barbaresco. I've probably had two or three in my entire life, but my first taste of this, I didn't eat any pennies as a kid, but I sure get a lot of copper and minerality on the nose <laughs> and, and and right on the palate. Well, you know, I, I have I, I haven't tasted yet. I'm about to, but the, you know, it's got a really nice nose. There there is some minerals on the nose. I love that. You know, and, and I'm a big fan of of that structure that comes with the, the wines. You know, I, I think people who want real just fruit all the time, that's great for wines that you're going to, you're going to have with, you're going to drink every day, but it's not really, it's not the type of wine you put away. It's not the type of wine that allows you to do many things with the wine or many types of food with the wine. That's why I, I always like that, that bit of minerality in there. Or minerality, mineralysis, is that a word? I don't even know what the word, but you know, I think you know today. what I mean. It is today. <laughs> Um, I, yeah, I, I just, and I get a lot of strawberry too, um, on the palate and I, oh, and I'm yeah. one who's not very, very good with the nose of the palate. I just enjoy wine, but for my simple palate, I do get a lot of strawberry and fruit. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, it's like this, one of the things I always try to, I always want people to understand is wine is wine. You, you don't have to. In, you don't have to agree with what someone who reviews a wine says. I, I always say this, like I used to, when I was really heavily into collecting all that, Robert Parker's wine reviews, I agreed with what he was saying. I didn't always agree with the score. And that's because my own palate is different, you know? So in, in, and what I mean by that is like, he might give something, the way he might describe it, exactly as I would describe it. And he gives it a, some 97 and I go eh, more like a, more like a 90 or an 89 to me, you know, and, and things he might put at the 90. I think, no, that to me is the great wine. And I put it higher, but I agree with what he's saying. And that's one of the things we have to, I think when we talked to Channing Fry, he was kind of in that same vein is that there's, there's too much, it's such a subjective thing with wine. And there are certain things that make great wine. And I think we all agree on that. It doesn't mean that we all agree on the greatness of the wine or where it, where it is within that quality structure. And you said your simple palate, but that's that's what who needs who needs a complicated palate? I don't want one. I I like knowing that you know what? Hey, if I if you said to me I taste strawberries and I go, whoa, I taste black licorice, we have a problem. But. I taste strawberries. I taste red fruit. I smell red fruit. I get some mineral in there. One thing that's interesting is Barbaresco's, and I'm a fan of the Nebbiola grape. I've, I've, I've have, had a lot of Barolos. I've had a, a lot of, used to drink Barbaresco's more because they're, they're easier, well, cheaper, um, easier to drink right away, much more approachable. I love them with, uh, if I do some sort of bar, like a smoked brisket or rib or something like that, I like I like them with that. I like them with with that caramelized meat taste. Um, 
what's interesting about them is generally they don't have enough body to last as long as a Barolo, but they will. They'll, but that's why they open up so much more, so much earlier. I, st- I, you know, I was, I was worried. I thought, you know, I'm, I'm drinking these 17. I thought, well, it probably needs a couple more years before I sh- it should open. But no way. This is open right now. This is good. <laughs> this, this does not need a couple years to open. I, I would disagree if, 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 if I, if I read anywhere, oh, don't open this till 2025. I go, no way. Open this right now. This is, this is good stuff. Um, I think you'll like it. It's it to me it it shows what it, you know what i guess barbaresco is like a a little bit more of a tannic minerally ca- um pinot it's got those same pinot qualities of the red fruits the smoothness the 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 if you're picturing it like a recording linear kind of filled in and plush but it, and it doesn't have that but it's got a little bit of that and here's a music adage, a little bit of that CD sampling quality where you get the little chunks, what, what in, in your ear would be tinny, but in their mouth are little bits of spikes of mineral and flint and things like that. And I like that. It's kind of neat. You know, that's a, uh, it's, I think it'll smooth itself out in a couple of years, but this is so drinkable right now. All right. Well, and I'm going to go, I'm going to go with the obvious here. The first thing I think of having this with would be a great bolognese. Oh yeah, that is obvious. But you're right. It, it's it's, but that's why it's obvious, right? Because it's yeah. right. It, it, it's like have that with a bolognese sauce. That's that'd be that'd be great. Have it with something rich, something that has caramelized meat and and something that's got that the umami that that thing in your mouth that makes it ripe and good and feels good. That savory. This is the perfect wine for it. Yeah. All right. Well, Glenn, I appreciate uh, I appreciate your time, and uh, I appreciate you hopping on, giving your thoughts on this, and we'll we'll talk to you on the next episode. Well, you know, anytime you need me to give my thoughts on a wine on a whim on a moment's notice, I am here for you, my friend. All right. Well, you hit it out of the park. Thanks, man. Thank you. So there, George, you got a good taste. Uh, I don't mean that as a pun. I mean that literally because Glenn is uh, Glenn. Uh, I wish we'd had a chance to have Glenn connect with you live because he spent several years while he was playing football, working at Mondavi and had an incredible hands-on experience. And so uh, in our little group here, starting outside the vines, we all defer to Glenn. No, he had a great, uh, uh, for his tasting expertise. And again, we thank Central Wine Merchants for this wonderful wine. Uh, I, I, I just, I'm so, I live in California, so I have to be careful how I say this, but I just so love Italian wines. It's, it's crazy. So this has been wonderful because I, take on what you said because it's Brunello in my world and then the default becomes Barolo and every so often somebody says why don't you try a little Barbaresco and our, our Dalba and one of the the great I, I thankfully have been to Mount Etna and I happen to have had some connections with somebody who owns a winery on the side of Mount Etna so who the heck would think that but I under I learned as you would have volcanic soil Boy, Boom talk about for sleeper, great growing, right? sleeper wines right there. That's that's one of my, when people say, you know, what what should I be looking out for? What are some emerging areas? Or what are some under the radar wines right there, Ted? That's top of the list. Nero d'Avola, Nerello uh, uh, Muscolese from the you know, Etna region. Absolutely. But, yeah, you know, there's, the, you know, there's on, on the Sicily, island of Sicily, that is this active volcano. And that's what I had to learn. People like me that don't understand it. Volcanic soil is actually great. It's the most richest soil that you could ever ask for grape growing. Well, one one of the also too with Barbaresco, one thing to remember is we, you know, we as wine lovers, enthusiasts, we we drink great, we drink great wines, we enjoy wine, but we drink wine young. I mean, I collect to some level. I mean, um, we all sort of, but most people they buy wine and they drink wine. And the, the amount of time that elapses between that purchase and the consumption, actually, nationally, it's about 30 hours, which is amazing. And that, that's the average amount of time between consumption or purchase and consumption in this country. So one of the attributes of Barbaresco versus, let's say, Barolo is that it is inherently a little less tannic, a little more approachable and a little more drinkable in its youth. So... That's a great fact. That's a great fact. I would have never known that. So that's a perfect lead into a great question. So George, again, the educated grape educates. When is a wine ready? I'm going to my local wine shop wherever I live. I'm I'm Adam and I'm in the beautiful part of Kirkland, Washington. I'm going to my wine shop. I say, I want 
for dinner tonight or dinner this weekend? When do all of us go in there and try to understand when is a wine ready? <laughs> so which that's like a series, that's a podcast series. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But um, it depends, you know, it obviously it depends on the grape variety, Ted, and it, and it depends on where that wine is from and who's making it, right? So a lot there. But let's say, you know, I will say 90% of the wines that are produced in the world are ready to drink when you buy them, yeah. okay? So then there's, you know, wines like maybe the one that we're having tonight where although this is lovely now, it will certainly enhance over a period of time. So I think you have to know which, which grape varieties can, you know, can mature um, obviously, higher tannic varietals like um, like Cabernet Sauvignon, like um, you know, like Nebbiolo from Barolo, you know, like um, you know, Alianico. I mean, there's there's, there's several. Um, they can they can last a little longer because of the tannin level. But but Barbera and Dolcetto and and uh, Pinot and Gamay. There's these are wines that are a little lighter and more approachable. But um, you know, it's really, it's, it's what grape variety is and where it's coming from. And, um, you know, the vintage, if it's a great vintage or if it's, you know, maybe not great vintage may take a little longer to, to come around, but, um, and I think George, that's, it's a great point because that again, having had the privilege of spending a lot of time in Paris and a fair bit of time in Italy, and you learn that you can walk into in Paris, for example, the supermarché supermarket, and I can for eight euros, buy an outstanding bottle of Bordeaux for dinner that night, because that's what the French do. <laughs> they buy their bottles of wine to drink, and they obviously can't, therefore, spend 100 euros a night on their dinner bottle. They buy it that night. And that's not something, it, 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 at least to me, and, and please, if I'm wrong, tell me, it doesn't strike me that's the way most Americans look at buying their wine. I'm, I'm really glad. I, I want to comment. That's a great point you make. And a lot of people say, oh, you know, I went you know, to Paris. I went to, you know, to to Tuscany or once somewhere the, the local wines delicious. Of course it is. Um, but another great tip to your question about how wines can age. This is a really good rule of thumb. The, uh, the AVA, the Appalachian, the growing region of the grapes. So the broader you get, the larger the growing region is on a wine, typically the more approachable and drinkable it is in its youth. Example, you look at Piedmont, Piedmont Day, right? So Within Piedmont, there's a region called Lange. Lange makes wines from the Nebbiolo group. Lange wines are $22 and under in a nice wine shop. And there's some lovely examples. I drink Lange. Lange is a great Wednesday night wine. You're having roast chicken and, you know, you just want to pull a cork and have a lovely bottle of wine that for, for 20 bucks. Barbaresco, this is twice the price, right? I mean, so obviously it's a growing region that's much smaller, much more precise, you know, more complexity, more, you know, more complexity. So the broader the ABA or the growing region, the lower the price and the more approachable and drinkable that wine is in its youth. That's, that's a great call. So what would be, and is there in your mind a tip to us consumers that you go in to your local and you see a wine, okay, this is not a wine we open tonight. This is a wine you put away and you wait three, five, whatever the time mm -hmm. blank is. Is there, is there, you know, for, for, again, for the, for the uh, consumer, is there an easy guide to go by in that regard? Well, you know, also, I mean, price point to generally the, the higher the price point, white or red, the more your, the more presence of oak you will have. Um, oak is a, you know, can be a lovely uh, enhancement to wine. Uh, I'm a big fan of barrel fermented Chardonnay. Um, mm. Not a lot of new oak, though. I, most producers, thankfully, now are, are dialing back the amount of new oak. But, um, you know, barrel fermentation in, in new oak will certainly allow the wine to, to mature over time and, and therefore, you know, allow it to, to enhance. So wines that are stainless steel fermented or all neutral oak um, will will show a little more approachable in, in their youth as well. So again, I think it's back to you know how they're made, where they're from. Um, that will dictate that. So it's I mean, there's a many many different examples though. What about decanting? When do you decant? Well, you can decanting. 
Decanting, you can decant anything. You can decant your Sauvignon yeah. Blanc, you can decant your Chardonnay, you can decant your Sori Pitein Barbaresco. It's not going to hurt. Um, but certain wines can enhance like this with time. So why to decant? Well, you want to aerate. You want to accelerate the aeration uh, at, in, in, a, in a quick period of time. So young reds, perfect candidates for aeration. doesn't need to be fancy. You can have a, a nice crystal decanter or you can have a water pitcher. Just all you're doing is really splashing the wine into a larger vessel and then pouring, you know, and then pouring your pouring it out. Now, I'm more of a traditionalist. I always I have nice glassware, like a nice Bordeaux stem. You know, I'll pour I'll pour a little bit and just sort of I like to like to, to swirl it. But if the canting is won't hurt at all, it can only really help, especially with red wines. Um, another with the canting on older wines, if you do have something older. I would always recommend anything 10 or 12 years and older. When you decant, you want to decant over a candle. So you want to make sure you're separating the sediment with the, um, from the wine. Now, I, what I did to, for me tonight, I have a, I'm a big fan of Corvin and I have an aerator. So if you have a Corvin, it's a nice, it's a, it's a fun gadget. So really what you do is I think if you have a Corvin, you're familiar, but you, um, I don't know if I'm going to, yeah, we're gonna see this, but you we need them to sponsor our pie because we are all core. Adam is yeah, I mean, so you, you see that? Do so you see it spraying out? It's an aerator, and I got to tell you, yeah. this makes a big time difference. Yeah. So, um, you know, but aerate wines. It's not or uh, decanting. Not not going to hurt. Can only help. You just touched on something interesting, George. Uh, I took, I guess you call it a class once. From Regal on glassware. I took and the same one. The it was depth amazing. of the glasses, the different glasses for the different wines. How 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 much do you subscribe to that? Well, it's funny. So I, I teach a college course, and I had one I taught today, and I had my students, and one of my students did a presentation on glassware. Ironically enough, we didn't plan this, but you know, Regal. You mentioned Regal, so they make. I I have I, I enjoy Regal glasses here in my in my home and they literally make a glass for every varietal yes. and that may seem excessive but when you have a passion for wine you there's all all sorts of uh, tools to enhance your enjoyment but you know there's there's a there's absolutely a research and, and a reason for being so really it, the shape of the glass will dictate uh, and enhance the the aromatics of said variety and then also how the glass is shaped and how it comes off the glass onto your palate, depending upon the grape variety and the style of wine will also enhance the enjoyment. So, um, so there's definitely, they, they're, they're all real and it's all um, absolutely valid. But that said, for me, there's three wine glasses. So uh, three wine glasses, that's all I need is a Bordeaux stem like this, a Riesling glass, which is a smaller version. And a burgundy glass, which is sort of a, you know, a more of a, a bowl, sta a bowl yes. uh, shape. And that that's that's all you need. That's good. The ch I like that. The chalice version. Um, we touched on at the beginning, George, when we when we introed you about your connection with some Napa Valley uh, winemakers, including uh, a guy that we're going to have on this pod, Rob Davis. Uh, tell me about because, in fact, I met Rob through. Baseball players. That's how I met Rob Davison. Had my biggest introduction into learning about the really great wines of Northern California was through athletes. So tell me, I mean, you, through your time, uh, your connections, and and the the various wires that you've encountered between sports and wine. Yeah, well, Rob, you know, we spoke about that. Rob, you know, I spent uh, three great years um, as. Um, East Coast sales manager for Jordan. I got to know Rob and travel with Rob and a uh, passionate baseball fan, as you know, and an amazing winemaker. Um, you know, he, you know, his contribution to Cabernet in the North Coast is, is, is huge. But, you know, I've, there's a curiosity, I think that's great with, with athletes and wine and, and it's, you know, the, the travel and the exposure and, and the experiencing different restaurants and different, um, you know, different uh, experiences like that. And um, there's just so much, there's just so much to contribute to. 
And whether it's, you know, I was out at Drew Bledsoe's place and, uh, you know, as you know, Ross, Adam Ross is right across the street from, uh, from uh, double back. And, you know, the commitment, you know, when you have resources uh, to lend to that, I mean, the commitment to producing something that's memorable is, is right there. So um, I love it. I, I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's wonderful. It's it's it, it is astounding, isn't it? I I was blown away when I first learned about this, and again I learned it through baseball. But then our very first outside the vines, Adam arranged for Drew Bledsoe to be with us, and to hear his passion. I mean, I knew he was involved, but to hear his the depth of his passion, and then uh, a, a baseball player, Rich Aurelia, who I had known for a long time, partners with Dave Roberts, who's now got a job managing the Dodgers. He's and they put out a fabulous. Uh, a set of wines at Red Stitch. It blows me away that they are this engaged. Uh, and and I, actually, I, I don't know. Uh, he's sadly, we lost him last fall, but Tom Seaver became someone that I was, yeah. he was my idol as an athlete growing up. And then I got to know him, work with him, become friendly with him, saw firsthand his devotion, hands on, even though he knew nothing about making the wine, he let someone else make the wine, but the actual daily work in the, in the vineyards, hands on. And it blew my mind that here's one of the greatest pictures of all time. And he would go out and twist and tie little tiny vines himself and make sure everything was watered and drive the entire grounds of his vineyards every day. It blew my mind. Well, no, and that's that's actually special. And that's very that's very unique. But going back, back to your initial question, when I was at Four Seasons in the 90s in New York and Santa Barbara and Washington, D.C., so on a nightly basis, whether there was a team in town that was staying at the hotel, I saw, I remember early on, just the curiosity and the, I mean, the interest uh, in this luxury product, this, this not even doesn't have to be luxury, but this, this beautiful, this beautiful, uh, you know, beverage that brings joy. And, um, and then, you know, when you're, when you're done with a career, you're, you're in your thirties or whatever your age is, and you have more than half your life left to be able to dedicate it to something like that, to an industry like that and have the, the ability to do that and have a new passion. Um, so, you know, I remember seeing a lot of those athletes just very curious, very inquisitive. All right. We have, so on the sports thing, we have the world series coming up. <laughs> you, I mean, is, is there a certain wine? I mean, I know we have different weather conditions in different parts of the country, uh, wherever you're watching the world series, but let's just say it's fall. It's the fall classic. What kind of wine would you recommend for the World Series? So there are um, there are wines that um, that we can talk about. Food. What, what will we pair with this? What's a, you know? What's the food pairing? What are the attributes? What are the nuances? That's all great. I love that. I live that world. But also, we all want a wine that you know. Whether we're watching a movie or the World Series, we want to pull the cork and we just want the wine to just sing. And um, so I think for 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 that. You know, we talked about that. Nero de Lava, uh, Nero Davila is a great example. I think that's a great wine to pull a cork and enjoy. Uh, it's, it's, it's expressive. It's, you, it's right there for you. You don't have to think too much about it. It's, it's all there in the glass. Um, Zinfandel, right? So in, you know, Zinfandel from say Dry Creek or, or Sonoma, sort of a cooler climate Zin with some spice, but also some great fruit is delicious. Rhone wines, love them. You know, Southern Rhone, Gigondas, a GS, you know, a GSM or a Chateauneuf. These are wines that are delicious, um, interesting and sort of expressive. And, you know, just, you know, you don't have to sort of worry too much about, um, you know, what you're going to, what you're going to pair with it. Just, um, you know, pull the cork and enjoy them. All right, so you just hit on a, a sweet spot for me because I love the, and we all, I think probably all of us have some of this in our minds. We love that, let's say, secret weapon wine, the unknown wine. So Zinfandel, in fact, Rob Davis, and again, I promise we're going to get Rob on this on this show at some point this fall. Rob would tell me that if he could have made his own wine, if he wasn't beholden to the owners, and the owners, of course, want to run their yeah. uh, as a business, Rob would made Zin, and we found Raffinelli Zin in on Dry Creek and Russian River. My God, what a wonderful! That's my we say that's my wife is outside smiling when I say this because we love Raffinelli Zin. So give me George's 
secret weapon wine or wines. So for for that for the World Series or just in general? Hey, let's say let's let's okay. Here's one Thanksgiving. Okay, That's coming up. there you go. Football, oh. turkey, Thanksgiving, secret weapon wine. So there you go. So I'll go. I'll go here. I'll go. The most underappreciated, under the radar white wine that exists that people should absolutely, if you love wine, you need to wrap your arms around this one, is Chenin Blanc. Chenin Blanc from the Loire Valley, specifically, you know, from Vouvray or a little area called Savigny. So the great thing about, about Chenin Blanc is it occupies that really important space between, let's say, Sauvignon Blanc and Chardonnay. It's medium body. It's not light. It's not full. It's got texture. It's got acid. It's got fruit concentration. It's got um, minerality. It's beautiful. And it's, again, for, let's say, Thanksgiving, it pairs with so many different foods. But Chenin Blanc is the white secret weapon. Um, you know, I'd say for red, Syrah. Cool climate Syrah is amazing, whether it's from Sonoma Coast, uh, Santa Rita Hills, you know, Santa Barbara area, or Northern Rhone, all those three areas. Mm -hmm. My goodness. It's, it's sort of what we're tasting tonight, but with more density of fruit. So you get the sort of the smoked meat and the, you know, the, you know, the olive and the spice, but a greater density of fruit. So Syrah for red, cool climate Syrah for red, or you know, Chenin Blanc from, uh, from Vouvray. So I had him come back in here because I'm thinking, as I hear George say that, I'm thinking ambassador. <laughs> <laughs> well, come my, on, Adam. Well, and it's funny because he mentioned Syrah, but I did not hear the state of Washington. So um, <laughs> there, a bunch of our hearts here sank a little bit. But um, I, I just wanted to say uh, one thing, George listening to you talk here, you know, I was really interested and I'm, I'm, you know, we were talking off air about me taking some of his classes, but now the problem is I just want to uncork a few of my wines with me, just <laughs> kick back, watch some, watch some football and, and, and drink whatever I've got in my cellar, you know? Um, yeah, this has been, this has been so, and excuse the pun, very educational, very, yeah. very educational. It's been fun. Well, it's been, you know, it, uh, thank you. It's been my pleasure. And I just, you know, I'm, I'm so passionate about it. And, you know, what, what I love is that each of us, right, there's, there's you know, four of us here, but, you know, we all have our different path in our journey. We all have our place where we're comfortable. And I think with wine, we had that opportunity to expand that, to sort of get out of our comfort zone. And I think that's one of my great pleasures is trying to, if I can get somebody a little out of their comfort zone and experience something that they've never had before, never thought of, and take their enjoyment to the next level. That's, that's what it's all about. Adam, should I ask George what's his secret weapon wine with hockey night in Canada? Oh, well, I, I, you know what? I, I, I'm going to say one because I traveled through Canada in my, during my hockey careers, my <laughs> hockey career. Inniskillen, the ice wine. Oh, yeah. Oh, my. Have you ever had the Inniskillen? Sure. Um, it's, it's liquid gold. No, I'm telling you. Whoa. It is. So, yeah. Ice wine in Canada and and especially BC, right? Uh, well, Okanagan Valley up yeah. north uh, by you. I mean, yep. some great great wines up there. Yep, yep. So I'm sorry, I well, stepped I stepped on his thunder there. I, I had to pipe oh, in. That there. was great. <laughs> well, listen, we want to again remind people because we have had this incredible honor. Glenn had one sent to him in his home in Arizona. This this beautiful Barbaresco that we've been sampling tonight, the Sori Patin Barbaresco. And again, thanks to Central Wine Merchants in Flemington, New Jersey, for taking care of this tonight for us. And again, they ship anywhere in the United States, United States state laws, of course, providing. So if you have something you're looking for, it, you can't find it locally, try it on, those, on their site, centralwinemerchants.com. Thanks to them. Okay, George, where can people find you now that they've had a chance to meet and, and see and hear you? Where can they find you? So the educated grape.com real simple. I, um, uh, I specialize in interactive wine classes and wine events, but these days, you know, certainly through the, the pandemic, uh, having doing this for 20 years, live events, I pivoted pretty quickly to virtual and you know, I have a virtual uh, wine course, uh, every Thursday, a different grape variety, a different, uh, different, um, uh, you know, different, um, feature. So it's, it's been amazing. It's been a great experience. So Rob Davis, my friend, uh, has sent me a note about George. He said, Mr. GQ. <laughs> That's what he called you. <laughs> well, we worked together. Well dressed, term with... groomed, great sense of humor. And he said, one trip while working in New York, our national sales director 
planned a train to Connecticut. We hopped on a train from Penn Station. As we sat there, the train started to move, and I started singing, My Baby Takes the Morning Train. <laughs> George fell over laughing. Great guy, great family. Rob doesn't say that about many people, oh, George. Well, So bravo to you. That's uh, that warms my heart. Rob's great people, but yeah, that's the thing about wine, Ted. It brings it brings people together and, and and creates lasting relationships, and that's a blessing. So that's thank you. That feels great. So, Mister GQ, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> thank you, and I'm so glad you and Adam connected because Adam is is the brains behind this effort that we're all putting together to help promote wine and, of course, touch on that connection between wine and sports. But thank you so much, George, for joining us oh, and for educating Paul. us. Thank you so much. Adam, Ted, thank you. Uh, thank you, George. Really, really great. Great. Best of luck to you. Cheers. Cheers.